everyone, we're back with a new video where we're going to go briefly over all 17 missions in SPV3. I say briefly, as with 17 missions, even a minimal amount of information is quite a hefty video. So without further ado, here's an overview of all the missions in SPV 3.3 and the notable changes that we've made both compared to the original campaign and in this new version. Discovery. There's not too much to note here. You can preview all of the new Cortana options in this map but we've also used the extra space so that you can look at all the new marine armors and new vehicles we've included. In the hangar bay cinematic, you can see ODSTs gearing up, all the new marine variants running around, the new collection of warthogs, the mongoose, the sparrowhawk, and the grizzly tank. It's also a nice visual showcase for all of our new advanced graphics features. Pillar of Autumn. This mission is twice as long as the original. We shifted it from being less of a tutorial mission, as anyone playing SPV3 should be familiar with the original game anyway. This mission also gets you acquainted with the new base sandbox of SPV3, and it introduces lots of new weapons and toys up until you get to the new areas, which were designed to be bigger, more open, and unique compared to the repetitive hallways of the original. In 3.3, we restored some cut dialogue that was in older versions of the cinematics, and opened up a few new areas to explore. In addition, Pillar of Autumn has some secondary objectives, such as making sure the crewmen are maintaining the gravity on the ship. If you fail to keep them safe or reactivate the terminals, the gravity will cut out intermittently. Halo. In Halo for SPV 3.3, we added an option for you to change the sky to level. Other than that, nothing major has changed here. We introduce in Halo to you the second half of the base sandbox, as well as things like wildlife. An optional way to play past the first big encounter is to activate the life pod beacon, which will bring all five Covenant dropships down on you at once. Two new areas are added, one where you have to rescue marines who have been captured by the brutes, and one where you have to defend and capture alpha base from the book The Flood, which SPV3 canonically replaces, and use an AA wraith to defend it. In 3.3, we added an alternate opening too, based off the leaked 1749 build of Halo. So if the Banshees in the beginning spot you, the Covenant dropship will move to intercept. We also added an encounter based off cut dialogue, which gives the camouflage elites a second reintroduction. Truth and Reconciliation. This level has two major additions in SPV 3.3. One which is an extended end cinematic, with new dialogue from the 1749 build. The other addition is that we allow you to use the Lemuria weapons as an optional loadout. This level also has some of our most advanced lighting, making use of our directional light map systems and new post-processing to produce some stellar looking cliffs. We also introduce silence weapons here, undermounted grenade launchers, hunter variants, and the brute piercer along with brute commanders and chieftains. This mission is a great showcase for our visor ability and is included in the base loadouts. In addition, we remove some of the difficulty specific conditions so you get more enemies in certain areas and lower difficulties and more marine reinforcements compensate for that. So the battles are often bigger and pelicans will fly in and deliver airstrikes. The Silent Cartographer. This level has some great new lighting as we set it at sunset. Fun fact, I had a laptop literally run for over a month running the new lighting. Luckily, advancements have been made since then to speed it up. Other than that, the biggest thing of note here is that we restored some cut encounters that never made it to the original Xbox. There are extra banshees and ghosts on this level, and the beach encounter was beefed up considerably in scale, while still just in line with the original game's difficulty. That was a tough one to do. This map also introduces the player to the Honor Guard elites. We use them almost like they are the Secret Service, so they go and secure important locations to make sure they are safe for the profits and have special energy shields so they can actually defend them against snipers and assassinations. Since SPV 3.3 has less fall damage, you can actually skip fights going down to the map room and fight double the enemies on your way back up. The Silent Cartographer Evolved. This mission is 100% original and was developed as its own internal standalone project. Its integration to, into SPV 3 has been problematic at times, as it is more demanding than other missions, making it difficult to work on from a development perspective. Its original vision was very different than that of traditional Halo CE and the silent cartographer which inspired it. It plays very differently than anything else in the project. That said, it's got some of the most draw-dropping environments, complex Forerunner interiors, and beautiful art. It also has the most advanced lighting in the entire project too, a task which took months for the original artist to nail. In SPV 3.3, we have two times a day of it, so you can see a slightly cooler set of lighting when setting the map to midday, or the warmer, more contrasty lighting set at dawn. 
This mission does not support Master Chief armor customization. Assault on Control Room. There is a lot to cover here, so let's blow through this. One, we have more dropships that were cut from the original game. Two, we considered cutting down some of the copy and pasted rooms. They are the majority of the game's stealth sequences. Three, we did cut some areas of this mission to make room for new areas. It's the only mission where we actually cut original play spaces. Four, the new play spaces are massive. I have a vidoc on my channel if you'd like to learn more. Five, you can fly the Banshee and also use the Grizzly here. Six, if the Grizzly survives up until the end, you can use it in two betrayals. This is part of our cross map unlock system. Seven, we changed this area up because it was always really infuriating. Eight, it's really, really long, even compared to the original. 343 Guilty Spark. This was a difficult mission to work on, as it's never been as really gameplay focused as much as it was atmosphere focused. It also has to serve as the first level of the second half of the game, which was released separately as SPV 3.1. In SPV 3.3, it adopts the opening sequence of 1749 where the enemies are waiting for you to jump out of the dropship. It's a case where something new may not entirely be better than what originally shipped, but it's certainly more interesting. This map boasts some beautiful use of our ray tracing solution for screen space reflections, as well as unique water effects. Upon finding the flood, we throw everything at you in a matter of minutes. We saw this mission as a demo for the rest of the game, repeatedly bashing you over the head with new flood form after flood form and a gross sense of paranoia as we introduced the flood pods inspired by Gears of War 4 and real-time infections. Library. This mission is a lot of fun despite it being the low point of the original game. The new flood forms and their unique AI based on the hosts which they have infected help mix up the gameplay. New weapons make it so you aren't quite as reliant on the shotgun as you were in the original game. Sentinels and the Enforcers provide new, more unique backup, and the Covenant have invaded the library and set up checkpoints which helps break up the flood combat, and allow you to manipulate the three-way fights to your desired outcomes. You get full access to the Sentinel beams and in 3.3, the Incineration Cannon as well. Vehicles are also available, so at times you can just hop in a wraith and tear through the waves of flood. If you hated the library in the past, this interpretation should be a welcome surprise. Two Betrayals People love or hate this one. It's super long, and we intentionally ignored pacing for it, because up until we added new missions to the campaign, this was the only outdoor Covenant vs. Flood map. It's also the only map with dedicated air combat sections where you can fight enforcers and use the Sparrowhawk. The mission was always divisive, even in the original game, but it offers so many unique combat scenarios, it was really hard to remove any of it. At the end of the day, people are playing this project because it adds a new twist to an old favorite, and we wouldn't be doing our jobs if we didn't embrace taking advantage of every unique thing we could do. Also, getting the Sparrowhawk working was way, way too much work and an accomplishment to not milk it for everything it's worth. Keys. This is another divisive mission. Going to the heart of a flood-infested ship filled with flood pods and warring factions will push even the most seasoned players to their limits. The pods provide a constant state of paranoia, you will never know which enemies are about to pop out or what collateral damage from a grenade will unleash. Warner enemies have been added to this mission to assist in the three-way fights, and the Covenant and their desperation use human weapons more so than ever. It's sort of a slog, but that's what this mission needs to do. Show the overwhelming might of the Flood, and just have you try to survive as you cut your way through. None left behind. While some people dislike Halo CE for reusing level geometry, it was quite a cool thing back in the day when the game came out. None Left Behind ties into the book First Strike and tells the story of how only a few marines made it off the ring. You see here the situation on the ring further degrading as the fighting in the valley you landed in has lit the surface of the ring on fire. The remaining marines are trying to hold out. Your job is to save them and you will always fail. This map allows more three-way fights with vehicle combat and really lets us take advantage of having the enforcers as an enemy. Spec Op Covenant become a common enemy here mixed in with the rest of the Covenant. Part of the fun of this mission is revisiting areas that you never really fought in before, and it shows the strength of a good sandbox when encounter spaces can be fun in areas never designed for combat in the first place. The Commander. This map was inspired by a test map one of us had made before we started SPV3, simply as a way to test playable elites. When we started SPV3, it seemed unique enough to be its own mission, and much of what existed in the test map transformed into this. As someone who was never a fan of playable elites for a number of reasons, this map presented an interesting challenge as to how to do them right, and not as an identical reskin of the Spartan or the Master Chief. 
While the elites have buffed movement speeds, health, and shields to reflect their durability on different difficulties, they are also more vulnerable and resistant to certain weapons. The biggest change in limiting them to only covenant weapons. While it makes sense in the lore, it also puts a unique twist on the gameplay, as you must rely on less weapons, which are less effective at range than when is playing as a Spartan. The last big change is the energy sword. As someone who always detested the energy sword as it drew away from the gunplay, the sword was built into the elites as an armor ability, allowing you to use it in brief spurts when cornered and backed into tight spaces. Originally, this mission was meant to play like the mini version of Commander Revolve, but when it felt boring and just the worst version, we retooled this mission to be more open-ended, more focused on exploration of finding clues, backtracking, and having the difficulty and variety of enemies ramp up as you progress through your objectives. This mission is almost a mini version of what you can expect in SPV 3.4, also known as Halo Legacies, which will be our next project. This will be an open world with similar traits to this mission on a much, much larger scale. The Commander Evolved. This mission was actually planned out as far back as 2013, and we stood pretty close to almost exactly our original design docs. Using the silent cartographer Evolved as a base, we set out to detail the future Arbiter's story on the Halo Ring, treating it as a prologue to the events of Halo 2. Why did the commander who became the Arbiter turn his attention to the Flood, and what was the simmering conflict with the Brutes? How was it manifesting in the fight on Installation 04, and why did he not pay attention to the Master Chief? Why was it too late before he learned of the Master Chief's plan to destroy the Pillar of Autumn? All these elements of his trial in Halo 2 tie into the story here as the Brutes rebel against his decision when he decides to lead them on a mission against the Flood. The whole thing culminates in a boss fight at the end, which is a reimagining of the Tartarus boss fight in Halo 2. Going through the mission in reverse, all new encounters were designed around areas where you never really fought before, with former vehicle sections becoming on foot sections and warthog areas becoming ghost areas. There's also an emphasis on more spooky stuff, as you explore infested Forerunner facilities and see how the Flood have started to ingrain themselves into the Ring's computer systems. The Maw. This mission is another divisive one where we took a rather radical approach. The Maw in the original game wasn't really unique or stand outish other than the Warthog run at the end of the level. Our original plan was to make it a little bit more like Cortana in Halo 3 with some large new areas to explore based on Halo 5 and Gears' as as hives. However, when these plans fell through, new tools in development led us to have a new opportunity to alter the lighting in the level radically. We turned off nearly every light in the ship, forcing the players to be reliant on their flashlight to navigate. What you get is a rather survival horror feel, where the flood creatures lurk in the dark, the dim lighting revealing their movements and their howls reverberating through the ship as you explore. As they start to turn the ship into one of their hives and prepare it to travel through space, you will encounter fleshy growths in the pods as you travel through the tunnels. You'll find Spec Op Covenant teams throughout the ship trying to secure it and cleanse it of the flood. In SPV 3.3, we have added the energy sword to be available to the Master Chief as he can use it in place of the flashlight to light his way through the ship. New atmospheric effects allow the dull red emergency lights to diffuse through the smoke and flood fog, enhancing the visibility while obscuring the details of the objects within. Lemuria Landfall Lemuria is a three-part all-new campaign developed by another group of veteran CE developers, who entrusted us to revise it and update it to be part of SPV3. Early on, we decided that the regular SPV3 weapons had been played out and didn't suit the more open nature of Lemuria. We retooled the sandbox with a renewed focus on forcing players to close the gap between enemies and the player. This works great with the entirely different style of level design. Lemuria also boasts lush environments, brighter than that of I-04, and cleaner Forerunner structures. There are two big changes to the encounters in SPV3 Lemuria. At the top of the security wall, there are two extra waves of enemies which allow you and your AI companion Brandon to pick off rushing waves of enemies with snipers, something we never really had in any campaign mission prior. We also removed the drones from the original version of these maps and replaced them with enforcers and sentinels to allow three-way fights. Valley Battle The second mission of Lemuria revolves around a big scripted vehicle sequence and raiding a facility which houses an ancient Forerunner AI. The mission starts though with a beach landing, like Silent Cartographer until you get to the next area, where you have to hold off against Covenant armor while Longswords and Warthogs come to assist. In SPV 3.3, we introduced a new anti-personnel variants of the Wraiths and Turrets, and more Fuel Rod Shadows show up to combat the Warthog Caravan. Later in the mission, you uncover a Guardian which was decommissioned by the Forerunners due to its AI allying itself with the Flood. 
a change from the Stratos Sentinel in the original iteration. Fight for the future. The final mission of Lemuria and SPV-3. The mission is split into three parts, with the first third having you fight through the forest, battling stealthily to enforcers until you get to a grizzly tank. Then it's non-stop action as you clear a way for your marines to join you as you fight up to the main facility. This fight contains more vehicles than any encounter in the entire game and ends with you holding off against incoming waves of enemies. Finally, you enter the facility, face off against the Guardian and the Elite Admiral, who is our final boss fight. He wields an unstable carbine with explosive rounds, has active camouflage which is fully powered up when his shields are at full strength, and can use the Forerunner network to teleport in more of his minions. Luckily, the thermal vision can expose him when cloaked, and the health regen armor ability ensures no longer how long this fight goes on, you can always heal. But if you need to end the fight quick, you can always equip Sprint and Spartan charge him off the platform into the waters below. And that's it, that's our overview of all 17 missions in SPV 3.3. If you like this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up, and for more SPV 3 content, subscribe.